think most of us are familiar with the concept of lab-grown meat. Well, now one firm wants to put lab-grown seafood onto our dinner plates within a matter of years. You're actually looking at a selection of dishes from Shiok Meats, which grows shrimp or prawn from cells rather than requiring traditional mass farming and then fishing. The company says it's close to getting regulatory approval to sell their lab-grown product in Singapore with the aim of entering restaurants by the middle of next year. That would give food fans a cruelty-free and more sustainable seafood alternative. Here to discuss it, Sandia Shriram is the CEO and co-founder of Shiok Meats and she joins us now. Sandia, fantastic to have you on the show. Just start by explaining the vision. Sure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I think uh, you covered it. The idea was to not use traditional methods or not having to go into the oceans or set up large scale shrimp or lobster or crab farms. And so we work on shellfish or crustaceans. We extract stem cells from them and we make the meat that we eat, not the shell, the head, the eyes, just the meat inside that we want to eat. And the whole vision is to provide sustainable food, cruelty free nutritious and delicious for the mass population that we are and that we'll grow into in the next couple of decades. Okay, you make it sound so easy. The science part, that is. <laughs> Talk to me about the complexity of that, the ability to scale up, how long it takes. And I think the first thing I wrote was what about chemicals, hormones, additives, just in the process of, of trying to create this and, and scaling up? For sure. I mean, I can give you a first a short version of it. So what we do essentially is we take muscle or fat stem cells. That's essentially what your meat is made up of. So if you take a piece of shrimp and you deshell it and devein it, the meat inside is just pure muscle and maybe fat in lobster and crab, but in shrimp, it's pure muscle. So we take these stem cells and these stem cells are like cell zero of an animal. So they're like the birth cell of any organ, any tissue. So we take these stem cells outside of the animal's body, and these cells have an amazing capability to grow outside of the animal's body because we mimic the surrounding to feed, make them, sort of trick them into thinking that they're still inside the animal. So these cells then start forming the muscle outside of the animal's body in a large stainless steel tank called a bioreactor or a fermenter, much like a brewery, but instead of beer, you're sort of brewing seafood and meats here. And how we do that is by feeding these stem cells with nutrients. And that's where your question about chemicals and hormones and all that comes in. So one of the largest codes that we have cracked at Shiok Meats is not using any hormones or chemicals or any of the animal serums or any extracts from animals for this. This is called a nutrient mix or a nutrient broth, much like a soup for the cells to grow in and a nutritional sort of a protein shake. It's made up of proteins, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, and all of that. And we extract all of these ingredients from plants and we grow this liquid medium along with the cells. And in about four to six weeks, we get real shrimp meat, real crab or real lobster meat. This is sort of the shortened version of it. Of course, to answer your question on scale, we are not there yet. I think the industry is less than a decade old, the whole cultured, lab-grown, cultivated industry. So we are all trying to scale up our technology. I would say majority of the companies that started in the last, let's say, five to seven years, including ours, are at a stage where we can produce small quantity, quantities of it in smaller kilograms or pounds. But we are all aiming to get to that mass production that we need for the rest of the population. That will take about a decade or so. Oh, I've got so many questions now. Um, so basically what you're <laughs> saying, though, in terms of nutritional value, it's comparable Nutrition wise, I would say, I see, I, I don't want to say it's same. I know similar, it's difficult. Right? It is. We, yeah, it is very difficult. But I would say basal, um, basal analysis and tests by us have shown that the protein levels are somewhere there similar, I would say, but we can push that. Uh, the vitamins and the micronutrients are not there yet. So that one has to be tailor made. But all of this can be looked into from the nutrient mix that we're feeding the cells. Yeah, interesting, because you can tinker with it, which I guess was my next question. In terms of taste and texture, yes. though, similar or identical, arguably, to um, living shrimp or, or lobster. We were just showing some video there and the, the lobster roll. It actually looked yes. like lobster. My question comes down to shape. Shrimp shaped? Yes. Or lobster shaped? So you actually can sort of... Right. Yeah. Talk to me about the shaping right. process. We don't... We yeah, we don't have the shape or the texture yet. So if you have seen all the videos, you would see most of the products actually have a minced meat inside of it, 
even the lobster roll or the dumplings or the chili crab all of it are dishes where we use minced meat at this point because that's our final product but we are working on a 3d shape product but i would say that is going to add to cost and a little bit of complexity of the technology so we'll get there eventually but for now we're concentrating on the minced seafood market coming yeah. to taste it is actually inherent in our product we haven't had to manipulate it it is all inherent the umami flavor in fact at the end of our process the left out liquid medium that we have grown ourselves in or the meat in actually has so much umami flavor in it that we convert that liquid into a seasoning powder so our entire process is zero waste as well yeah because i think we've all eaten shrimp shrimp in the past that actually tastes of nothing and you're like wow you know i, I actually love the shrimp flavor but these taste of nothing so that's quite interesting too what about cost I mean, we've said it's you've got yeah. to scale it. It's early days, but I read something that said somewhere between two to four times, sort of in a in a um, mass equivalence for shrimp that you buy today. Obviously, the hope has to be that that Co comes right down. Correct. Um, I mean, when we started off five almost five years ago, we we were producing shrimp at about ten thousand dollars a kilogram. That oh. was what our pricing was. <laughs> And the first, I think, the first beef burger that was made by a professor in the Netherlands way back in 2013 or 14 costed him one patty, costed him three hundred thousand dollars. But we have come a long way. I think that company and that professor make it at a few few hundred dollars right now. We are at about fifty to seventy five dollars a kilogram right now, which is still premium priced, I would say, for shrimp, but not so premium priced for lobster and crab if you think about it. And also in our case, if you're paying fifty dollars, you get hundred percent meat. You don't get the shell or the wastage or any of that. But we are working really hard to scale it up and make sure that the pricing goes down eventually with economies of scale. Yeah. Well, who's the client for this? Let's say in an ideal world, you get the price comparable. So on a price basis, there's no choice between between the two. Who's the client for this? Because I do think there'll be people watching going, oh, the cells and the cocktail and the mix. And this is not clean food, however you choose to look at it. Who is your customer and your client? I completely agree with anybody who says no or yes or maybe for it because I think at the end of the day consumers have the choice to choose what they want to eat you know what what they put on the table and in their stomachs as well so I would say early adopters for us are either flexitarians or people who don't eat meat for animal cruelty or ethical reasons for, for example vegans who have become vegans in their lifetime over their lifetime so we are seeing a lot of interest from early uh, early interest from millennials gen z's the younger generation that is extremely worried about the environment animal cruelty uh, nutrition at the same time what is happening to their body as well as the animal's body eventually when they eat meat so i would say it's more on the flexitarian but the essential target market in the longer run is actual meat and seafood eaters because what we're telling them is here's another choice for you to make you can enjoy the same taste of shrimp, crab and lobster or red meat or white meat or whatever it is, but it doesn't have to come from a slaughtered animal. Yeah, I also think to your point about younger people, the audience and the market will grow as they age and, and younger people have the same views as them as, as they grow up as well. Um, and at some point, given increasing population size and scarce resources, um, choice will be a luxury, I think, perhaps on some of these things, which ties to my next question, which is the plant based meat craze where everybody was talking about it. They thought the market would be huge. Um, founders and those in these companies that we've spoken to even recently have said, look, it is early days to, to your point, too. I just wonder whether you see this product that you're creating is different or similar in terms of um, ideals and whether there's a, a craze but that the, perhaps the danger is that it's tough to convince people i would say we have a lot of learnings from the plant-based meat industry they sort of did it first we're learning from them we have seen what they've done and we can learn from what not to do or what to do for example the market is growing i don't think we have captured even you know the cultivated industry hasn't even captured one percent of the total market yet and we are talking about a multi-trillion dollar market with regards to uh, dairy, meat, and seafood, for example. So it's going to take a couple of decades to get there, but we are on the positive stride to get there. And I think for plant with plant-based meats, if you compare, I don't think it's a comparison. We are complementary to each other. In fact, most of the cultivated meat companies, including ours, make hybrid products because at this point, a 100% cultivated product is probably too expensive. 
we can't, we are not at that scale. And, you know, the questions are too many by the consumer. So we are looking at a hybrid product. We, in fact, work with plant-based meat companies to make a plant-based and a cultivated hybrid product at the end of the day. Yeah, I think one of the um, perhaps mistakes, if I may say, that p members of that industry made was over-promising in the beginning. And you're certainly not doing that. I think you're very realistic about the time um, and what it's going to take, I think, to, to convert people and get people eating this. Singapore is also something that I see tying a lot of the investment and the location of these kind of businesses. And it sort of makes sense to me, given what 90 percent, I believe, of food for Singapore is imported. So they understand better than most the importance of um, food chain supply issues. Talk to me about being in Singapore and how supportive the government and regulators are pushing this. For sure. I mean, I have a very interesting anecdote here. When we started in August 2018, Singapore wasn't talking about food tech or food security or any of that. I mean, food security is always on our minds here because, like you said, we import 90% of our food. But then six months after we started the company, the, the week we launched our prototype dumplings, Singapore announced this whole food story and 30 by 30, where they want to increase their local food production from the current 10% to 30% by 2030. Um, so much millions of dollars are going to get injected into this industry and we're going to support plant-based and cultivated and insect-based and so on. And the whole buzz has been awesome for us. That boost has been awesome. But I think Singapore is basically setting an example for the world to show how the government, the private, the universities, the education sector, the startups, the large MNC companies can all come together to solve one big problem, which is food. And food is so essential for our livelihoods on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think through the pandemic, we learned that we weren't able to get the products that we generally walk into a supermarket and buy. It was hard to go and source them. There were so many food supply chain issues, disruptions here and there. And I think it also showed us that regional food production is what we should look at. So I think Singapore strengthened all of that. And they're working towards a step-by-step -step sort of a format towards showing the world how it can be done and also bringing in the regulatory framework, which is so important for cultivated meat as such. So we need a proper framework. It is a novel product. We need utmost safety assessments done. And we are happy that Singapore is one of the first countries to come up with a regulatory framework and also approve a product um, a couple of years ago. Yeah, it has to be collaborative and it actually has to be global because food insecurity is happening all over the world and it's only going in one direction. So, um, yes playing your role. It's going to be fascinating to watch progress. Sandia, for now, thank you so much. Great to chat to you. The CEO and co-founder there of Shiok Meats.